Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for coming to Fusion, the ultimate energy source. This event is hosted by the Center for Inquiry Canada, your community for science and secularism. My name is Shauna Watson, Vice President of CFIC, and I'll be your host for this talk. CFIC is Canada's only national nonprofit with the mission of promoting and educating the public on critical thinking, science, and secularism. We work to equip people to make decisions based on evidence, rational thinking, and compassion. To that end, we hold events like this to provide an opportunity for you to engage with subject matter experts on a variety of topics. In the continuing days of physical distancing, CFIC's events and activities are provided online, available from coast to coast to coast. We rely entirely on donations and memberships to allow us to bring you events such as this. Please visit our website, centerforinquiry.ca, or email to info at centerforinquiry.ca for more information about how, how to become a member, make a donation, or volunteer with us. We will we'll be recording this talk for eventual publication on CFIC's YouTube channel, and that will include the Q&A session. So if you don't want your name or your image to appear in a recording, please turn off your camera and change your screen name. To minimize background noise, we're muting everybody's microphones. If you have problems with audio or video during the talk, I suggest you can turn off your video. And uh, um, if you have other problems, you can send a message on the chat and we can see if we can provide you some support. After the discussion, we'll have the opportunity to ask questions by text. We'll use the Zoom chat window. Now, at the moment, we've allowed access to the Zoom chat for all participants, but we ask that everyone please keep your comments relevant and polite. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our guest speaker. Alan Offenberger is Professor Emeritus of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Alberta. He re received his BASC and MASC from UBC and his PhD from MIT. His research program for more than 40 years was focused on the development of high power lasers and their application to plasma physics and inertial fusion energy research. Dr. Offenberger is past president of the Canadian Association of Physicists and the founding president of the Alberta Canada Fusion Technology Alliance, now renamed the Fusion Energy Council of Canada. He has served in as an advisor as an advisor and consultant to university, government and industrial institutions in Canada and internationally. Now I turn you over to Dr. Offenberger. Good day, everybody. And uh, pleased to spend this time with you talking about my favorite subject. Let me uh, get on to the, th the story right away. Whoops. I'm suddenly, I'm suddenly not moving. Here we go. Uh, what we're talking about today is fusion. And uh, I don't know whether you think much about uh, the universe in your daily activity, but in fact, in our sun and all stars, fusion is the process that generates A, all the elements that we know of, and B, uh, the energy that we particularly appreciate on the surface of the earth. Uh, in the sun's case, and in many stars, it's simple hydrogen that is fusing together to create heavier isotopes and release energy in the process. In the case of bigger, older stars, you can also have higher chain reactions going on in fusion. Uh, but I'm going to be worrying about just the latest elements here. The comment is that the world has been working on trying to corral fusion energy as a power source for decades now. Uh, and in fact, the progress recently has been absolutely remarkable. And so while a lot of us think of 2050 as the end point, in fact, there's industrial partners now going into it saying, we're going to get it going by the 2030s. So we'll see what happens. Somewhere between the 2030s and 2040s, we and 50s, we expect to see fusion harness for mankind. So more about the story. Now, first of all, I have to distinguish for you, these are nuclear processes we're talking about, not chemical reactions. In the case of fission, 
that comes from the heavier elements and specifically elements like uranium, where if I add a neutron to a uranium-235 atom, it suddenly becomes a, a stable, an unstable a transient state that immediately breaks up into daughter products. Here I show two of them, barium and krypton. There's also cesium and iodine. They tend to be the long-lived radioactive waste that the world is worried about. Along with those daughter products, you get more neutrons, and those neutrons can go on in turn and do more fission reactions, and that's where the runaway aspect can come from. But at the bottom, you note that fission produces a lot of energy for one, and secondly, radioactive daughter nuclei. Now let me distinguish fusion, which is also a nuclear process, but very different intrinsically to fission. In the case of fusion, you're taking the lightest elements, starting with hydrogen, working your way up the atomic table. Uh, but in our case on Earth, it turns out to try and use H of H2O, that would be improbably difficult because of the energy that you would need to make the system work. It turns out that if you have the heavier isotopes of hydrogen, and I show two of them here, deuterium, which is hydrogen adding a neutron to it, and I show tritium, which is hydrogen or a proton adding two neutrons to it. If those two can be made to fuse, it turns out that the A, it's easier to do than for simple hydrogen, and B, the products of that reaction are twofold. One is a neutron that brings out most of the energy, and also helium. And helium, we tend to like it as a laughing gas kind of thing. In this case for fusion, then, you're getting energy plus non-radioactive daughter nuclei, and that's important. And I'm going to talk about the implications of radioactivity a bit later, but distinguish, please. It's a nuclear reaction, but it is far more benign than fission is. Okay, so the isotopes of hydrogen we're talking about are deuterium and tritium. And we're working on deuterium tritium initially because that turns out to be easier and you'll see why. But eventually we can also work with just deuterium and deuterium uh, because the oceans are full of it and we would have billions of years of fuel. So uh, that'll come along in due course as we uh, have learned from experience with DT. Now what's happening there then? So deuterium tritium, if they can be brought together to fuse, creating new particles, the helium and the neutron, that liberates then about 17 and a half MeV of energy between the neutron and the helium. There's a problem though, tritium, deuterium is there in the ocean, but tritium is not a natural isotope. It, whatever we produce in the world of tritium decays away with a lifetime of about 12.3 years. So it says if you're going to try and run a fusion reactor, you're going to have to produce the tritium in the first place to make the system work. Well, the way we do that is to take this neutron coming out of a reaction and we have it collide with lithium in a blanket surrounding the fusion reactor core. And it turns out when you take a neutron and add it to lithium-6 isotope, that creates for you more helium and tritium. Well, you process that loop on the blanket side, you extract the tritium and you feed that back in to become the fuel to work with the deuterium. So the net reaction we're talking about right now then is really a neutron that's transient in between, gives you heat and helps produce your fuel. But at the end of the day, the two fuel pieces are deuterium and lithium and the ash totally is helium plus energy, of course. The key thing here is that when you have a fusion, a nuclear reaction, you're producing energy that's several million times larger per event than when you have a chemical reaction, such as burning carbon in gasoline or uh, petroleum of any form. And I give you one number here. If I can burn one gram of deuterium tritium fuel, that's the same thing as burning 10 tons of coal. It's a dramatic difference in the content that uh, you have to work with. Deuterium we can get from seawater, lithium from land and seawater. And while we wouldn't work with lithium forever as initial reserves, in fact, we're saying that if you converted that to tritium and burned with deuterium, 
it would already give you 12 times the energy reserves of adding up all of all the fission possibilities and all the fossil fuel possibilities combined. So we're talking about enormous uh, reserves of uh, lithium to start with, let alone going to pure deuterium in the long run. Okay, here's the context for today's discussions. As you appreciate, the world demand for energy is increasing dramatically as the underdeveloped world uh, tends to try and work to the state of uh, the world, uh, developed world. Along with it, though, we're finding we can't keep burning fossil fuels. It has to stop. So decarbonation is the change driver in the course of our producing ever more energy for the world to consume. And that's why fusion will become important by mid-century. And as I'll talk later, uh, it could be sooner, in fact. Much of the world is involved in fusion development. Canada, in fact, is an outlier, and I'll come back to that. At the end of the day, apart from getting energy and doing it sustainably and clean using fusion, it's going to generate a whole raft of new industries uh, and jobs uh, along the way. And there's spin-offs in the technologies I highlight here. Uh, they're dramatic and important. And here is a chance for Canada to get engaged. And it's, in, it's important we do so. Okay, the outline of the talk then, I'll give you the context by just briefly going into the challenges we face, how fusion, uh, what is needed to make that work. Uh, it discuss the progress that has been made in uh, fusion development. I'll raise the alternative concepts that industry is starting to put on the table now to try and speed things up, and a brief comment at the end on the future of fusion and its impact. And I do want to uh, thank all the different sources over the years that I've used material from various labs and people uh, in putting it together. Okay, first topic, energy and environment. Well, we're going to have the demand, the sustainability is a key issue and environmental impact. Here's a, a graph I put together with a colleague back uh, oh, 15 years ago in terms of extrapolating information that we gathered up from the International Energy Agency and EIA and IAEA and all the rest in extrapolating demands and growths for various countries around the world. So this represented a catch at the time of where the world was going. You can see the projections are taking us from way down at the present now period uh, into a much larger energy future. And of that total energy, you'll notice that electrical capacity is the biggest increasing component that we're concerned with. So why is fusion energy important? Well, first of all, we're saying electricity is going to be the most important energy currency going forward. Uh, we not only have it for industrial and uh, residential, all the needs we currently know, but as the world goes into electrified transportation, along with ever more computer use, and when you think of the bitcoins of the world and the uh, server energy demands that they, they exceed various countries' usage already, we're talking about very large increase that we may not even get right in that previous slide. Of the only non-carbon solutions that give you, give you sustainability, the first one then is renewables. We're working very hard on that now, but it will never do the job. But you may not appreciate that. Uh, and in fact, just the uh, tracking uh, that's done internationally just came out with a report a week or so ago, pointing out that even well, we could expect probably to achieve 30% of energy, but even with heroic efforts, you're unlikely to reach 40%. So that says the renewables will try and do a good job, but they're not going to get us to where we have to be. What about fission? Well, in fact, if you take the current nuclear fuels and said for the world that as we have it right now, we shut down absolutely every source of power generation, all fossil fuels, converted it immediately to nuclear fission, how long would we have in the way of fission fuels? The answer is 30 to 40 years. We don't have enough. So it means you have to go to fuel breeding uh, to sustain fission, and then we can do that 
for quite a bit longer. But the, in the course of trying to move there, you might as well go to the ultimate one, which is fusion, because that is truly sustainable. You'll never run out of fuel. It can become the primary energy source, and it can really feed the electricity you need, the heat you need for industrial process, and the generation of hydrogen. And we know that besides electricity, we're going to be going to fuel cells for both mobile and stationary applications. So fusion really becomes the core of where you want to be in the long run. And I mentioned just a few things down below. About fusion, it, it's on demand, it's base load, it's there 24 seven, unlike other sources. Uh, you can turn it on and off, uh, you'll get the heat and uh, generate things. And desalination, key thing, as you appreciate, water is becoming a critical element in terms of clean water. Fusion will be able to do all the desalination you'll, you'll want. And in fact, it can even be used to clean up your fish and waste. Okay, so why is it desirable? Well, it's inexhaustible. There's no greenhouse gas or air pollution, and helium is the only ash. There's no long-lived radioactive products as for fission. There's no afterheat. That's the issue with the Fukushima reactor. It's the afterheat of the radioactive nuclides, nuclei that are uh, requiring the additional cooling that for sustained periods. Uh, you don't have that as an issue. There just isn't enough heat content that you can shut it down and it'll dissipate the heat right away. There's no risk of a nuclear accident. So you never have to worry about public evacuation of people. And key thing, it has the highest energy dense density of any fuel source. And I'm going to show you two graphs. The things that I refer to at the bottom, energy payback ratio and life cycle assessment. This is what the environmentalists use as a way of measuring the relative merits of different fuels. Uh, and it's literally cradle to grade, the finding, the exploring, the uh, exploration, the burning, the waste handling, and so on. And both of those are better than fusion, even than solar, wind, and fission. And here's one graph. And you'll note at the bottom, first of all, I refer to LCA for coal. It's up at the thousand. So I didn't even try and put coal and natural gas on this graph because it would have dwarfed uh, the ones that I wanted to highlight in relative comparison for the future. So if I take the life cycle assessment in the uh, blue bars, you'll see how the various possible sustainable clean fuels work and fusion is at the high, is the best. If you take the energy payback ratio, I gave you three numbers along the way uh, showing fusion compared to others as well. So we've got all of the good factors going there. If you look at the impact of energy sources on land, uh, biofuels all the way through uh, putting up wind power and so on, again, nuclear, uh, is the minimal one compared to all others. Here's a graph I put together a long time ago, and it took the idea that if I had a one gigawatt, that's a 1,000 megawatt electric plant running, how much fuel do I have to handle uh, in and out every day for it? And you see for the coal plant, and that's a generic number, it can be more or less depending upon the quality of coal, but it's about 10,000 tons of fuel you need every day, which just automatically, the stoichiochemistry gives you 30,000 tons of carbon dioxide, and it gives you a lot of other nauseous byproducts. And that fly ash, incidentally, includes radon and radioactive uh, waste that people don't even think about when you're burning coal. In the case of a fission plant, you're already down to just 77 kilograms, 170 pounds. So a small amount of fuel. Fusion, that comes down to one kilogram. So compare a kilogram for a day's operation compared to 10,000 tons of coal. And uh, this little graphic at the bottom from Laser Fusion Express, that was the provided uh, uh, General Atomic uh, years ago. The idea of one carload of that filled with fuel pellets for laser fusion uh, versus comparing it with that as a hopper for coal. So advantage fusion when you look at the sheer waste that you have to handle at the end of the exercise. Okay, let me tackle right away the question of neutrons and radioactivity so that uh, it, it's out in front of us. In fact, fusion produces neutrons and helium. 
the helium is totally benign. The neutrons come out, that's the ones you want to capture their energy in a blanket and then circulate that to generate your power and heat and so on. But those neutrons interact with the material that you have in the wall of the reactor device. So they can do some damage depending upon what the material is. The first thing I'll note is that whatever material you do activate does have a much shorter half-life than for fission products. And I'll show you a graphic in a minute. Uh, so it is not as bad as for fission. Secondly, you can mitigate it by choice of materials. And I mentioned here carbide, silicon carbide, for example, that has absolutely no issue at all. So it comes down to picking the materials that you want to work with in building your devices. And I also mentioned here then the various half-lives are such that you can bring it down to the radioactivity level of coal, ash, which is what we live with now. Tritium, in fact, is a bigger issue to be concerned with because it is radioactive. It decays in 12.3 years, and so it needs careful handling. But the amount in the reactor is very small and such that even if there were an escape of that, it wouldn't risk a public evacuation in the vicinity of a plant. And more importantly, we need that tritium. That's the fuel of fusion. We certainly are going to go to heroic efforts to make sure we recover it from the fusion uh, plant and reuse it because it's the fuel. I would note in passing that tritium hazard itself is in fact a lower hazard than the coal ash, which we're already exposed to and have been uh, for 100 years in terms of uh, comparing it with all other sources here. And fusion fuels, they're not subject to non-proliferation uh, treaties. So in fact, geopolitically, we can use fusion anywhere in the world and nobody's gonna complain about it. Unlike the people right now being concerned with which countries have fission reactors and which don't. Here's the graphic I mentioned. If you take the top blue line there, that's fission in a light water reactor and the decay of the radioactivity induced uh, in, a, in an operating reactor in terms of what's happening years after shutdown. If I take the red line, that would be fusion. If I were to go out today and build it entirely out of ferritic materials, iron and steel and so on. And you'll notice that already it decays off much faster. If I go to vanadium alloys, which I could do, that's the green curve. And in fact, within a decade, uh, you've got the decay down that you can work with it again. So it means that if I build a, build a reactor, run it, and then take it away and replace that center core and just bury the material for 10 years, I can dig it up and reuse it. So it is in fact entirely recyclable and indefinitely. Okay, let's turn to the uh, fusion. What is it? How does it work? And uh, what do we need? And my simple answer is, it's about heating and confinement. And I'll say at the outset that if you look at the decades uh, of work that's gone on since the 1950s, in fact, in theoretical and experimental work in computer modeling, all the other enabling technologies, they are very highly developed, so much so that it's in this last few years that industry has jumped in saying, it's time to get our foot in the door. So I'm going to talk about the mainline approaches and then raise their scopes too. Okay, two conditions are needed for fusion energy. The first is that deuterium and tritium, you're trying to get nuclear fusion. Both of the nuclei are positively charged. And you know from Coulomb's law is you try and bring charged particles together, that inverse square force law tends to want to keep them apart. It's hard to get them together. What is the way to do it? Well, the answer is we have to give the particles so much energy that they've got a chance of getting sufficiently close in separation that what is called the, um, the high uh, nuclear energy nuclear force can take over and pull them together. And this is essentially a quantum mechanical uh, situation. So I won't get into all the physics, but you can calculate what the probability is and, and hence what to do about it. And the answer is, 
if you can get to temperatures of about 100 million degrees, you can actually get fusion reactions going. Well, at those temperatures, all matter is ionized. It's not solid, liquid, or gas, the three states of matter we mostly know. It's in the fourth state of matter, which we call plasma. And in fact, the universes, all universes, are mostly plasma state. Uh, most out there is not solid, liquid, or gas. It's plasma, meaning it's positive and negative charges that you have. Well, if I've heated these things, this fuel, got positive and negative charges, uh, that sounds like a pretty difficult thing to control and keep together. And the answer is yes, it is difficult. And if we're ever going to get more energy out than we had to put in to heat these particles in the first place, uh, we're going to have to confine it. So the object of fusion is A, to heat the fuel, and then B, keep it together long enough that you have enough fusion reaction events to liberate more energy than you had to invest in the first place. And a key way of helping that is to bring the temperature up to what we will call an ignition temperature, such that the fusion process starts. And when the helium and neutrons come out from that process, the helium itself is a positively charged particle. If it can collide with other fuel particles, it can give up its energy internally to the fuel and keep heating it. So it's like you bringing a match up to a, a, a wet log, you initially give it a bit of a spark and then enough burning takes place to propagate that burn subsequently. Well, the helium in effect is that additional heating match uh, to keep the fuel burning all the way through. If you ask, is there a criteria in terms of describing not only the temperature you need, but the net confinement you need? The answer is yes. And one can derive a very simple equation, in fact, for it. It's known as the Lawson criterion after the man who first wrote it down. And it tells you that you must have the product of the density of your fuel, the particles per cubic centimeter, per cubic meter, times the confinement time greater than some minimum value. And now let's look at that. Okay, so why is it difficult? Well, A, we've got to heat that fuel to a high temperature, not easy. And B, we've got to confine it such that that density confinement time product exceeds a certain value. And here I've written down a number that corresponds to the condition where I've got the best temperature condition going. If I lower the temperature, I'd need a much higher end tau. But if I can get to the right temperature, that'll give me the minimum end tau. And you sustain it as burning by using the helium that's coming out from the fusion. Well, this has guided the world two ways to go about working with it. The first is magnetic confinement, and this is the longest lived since the 1950s. And it relies on the fact that charged particles, they can move along magnetic field lines, but they don't like to cross. They like to go into a gyro motion around magnetic fields. And so that gives you an idea that maybe we can use magnetic fields as the confinement approach. And I'll say more about that in a minute. The other extreme is to say, could we ever do it so we don't have to confine it at all other than through its own inertia? And that's what we call inertial fusion with the idea that we feed the heating energy in so fast, have the fusion reactions take place so fast that it all happens before that hot fuel could ever just explode itself away. And hence relying on just the intrinsic inertia and you've got to do it very fast. Well, the alternative approaches, uh, you can vary the density and you can vary the uh, confinement time. And the world outside commercially is trying to look at in-between schemes that you might get to fusion commercially uh, faster, cheaper, better, and so on. But I'm going to concentrate on these two extremes because that's where the world's research has mostly taken the progress. So in the magnetic case, then, you've got to heat it and uh, supply lots of extra heat to start it. In the case of inertial, you've got to bring in very short pulse driver beams to do it. Okay, on the magnetic, what are some of these magnetic ways? Well, a simple magnetic solenoid was the first thing that people tried a long time ago, and that'll do some confinement. 
The problem is the particles can run in and out the ends. They may not cross in the middle, but they can escape out through the end. So it's not the best confinement. What about if I took that solenoid and wrapped it into a circle and that's shown in the second, the uh, toroidal ring. Now it's not gonna give you an end loss, but here it turns out the particles just intrinsically want to set up electric fields that drive them out independent of what you want. So it turned out there you had to add an extra component, an extra magnetic field to help confine it. And I'll say more about that in a minute. But that's a pulse device because I have to pulse an electric current to induce additional magnetic fields. As a steady state device, what's called a stellarator, first invented by uh, Spitzer, a professor of physics at Princeton, uh, but hard to build because there you can see the complex magnetic field coils that you have to generate. So the world said, this is a bit too difficult. We're not going to do that so much as work on the tokamak field. But it would provide a steady state instead of a transient approach to the machine. OK, let me turn to the tokamak. This was, in fact, the invention on the magnetic toroidal scheme by Sakharov and Tam in Russia back in 1950. And they recognized that while particles could escape in a simple toroidal geometry, if you could add an extra current in along the, around the uh, circumference that induces an, an extra small, that's shown in red, poloidal magnetic field, the combination of the toroidal field around the entire device coupled with the poloidal field actually ends up being a corkscrew to drive around the uh, circumference and that could actually lead to a confinement. And indeed that has been pursued by most of the world for the decades ever since it's been the most successful approach in trying to work with magnetic confinement. Here you have still have to do auxiliary heating, whether you inject neutral beams with high energy or electromagnetic waves to get it up to your 100 million degrees. Okay, where are we with the tokamak? Well, uh, several hundred have been built around the world for research. Uh, the biggest one that's operating today is what's called the Joint European Taurus. It's based in uh, Cullum in the UK, funded by the European Union. It's been running for a couple of decades or more. And uh, it has a, a working volume inside the open uh, toroidal cavity you can see there of about 100 cubic meters. And it is actually with some deuterium uh, fuel in there has produced 16 megawatts of fusion power. But the net output to input is still less than unity. And that's what that Q refers to as fusion output over the heating you had to put in in the first place. They have now upgraded and updated the refurbished the jet. And in this next year, they expect to be running deuterium tritium fuel again. And I expect that Q to exceed unity for the first time. But that's the current state of the art. What about inertial fusion approaches? Well, the one driving the biggest activity so far is called central ignition. And you can see it under direct drive or indirect drive. With the direct drive, you take your pellet of fuel and you basically irradiate it in four pi. So laser beams from all directions that will come in and I'll show a schematic in a minute of how it works, but use those short pulse lasers to drive it up to fusion ignition conditions. The indirect drive is to say, instead of trying to hit the particle directly, what about if I take those beams, put the pellet inside a can, and then use the laser beams to heat up the walls of the can to a high temperature to emit x-rays, and then use those x-rays to drive the, uh, the fuel pellet uh, in, uh, in the compression. And that's called indirect drive. And I'll show you the results of that. In all cases, you're looking to compress and heat the pellet to bring it to ignition. And now we're talking about laser intensities. You can see the number there, like 500 terawatts per square centimeter of irradiance. These are very high power beams. Well, how does it work? You take a pellet, you irradiate it with laser beams or x-rays. What happens, those high power beams hit the surface, they immediately ionize the material on the surface, that material blows off, that's the little yellow arrow shown in the ablation compression figure. And in the course of Newton's law, if there's momentum in one direction, you get it in the other. 
So you're driving shock waves in shown by the little red arrows and those shock waves then drive in towards the center. And obviously in a spherical geometry, you're really compounding the effect of, of simple shock waves in the spherical geometry. And when all that energy coalesces at the center, you get a temperature spike that suddenly jumps to 100 million degrees that initiates a fusion burn. That's the ignition point in the slide there. And then the helium continues to be produced and continues to heat the fuel until you burn up that little fuel pellet. The output of that then, you get your helium and you get your neutrons coming out that you absorb in a blanket. So it's basically heat and helium uh, that comes out. The indirect drive just shows the configuration there, a schematic of the laser beams coming into the can, irradiating the walls to make them hot enough to radiate x-rays, and it's the x-rays that then compress the fuel pellet. Here's what you have as the state of the art for a machine. This is the National Ignition Facility. It's at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in the US, in California. You see one hall there, there's two halls like that, with, of laser beams. There's a total of 192 laser beams and a total output laser energy of 1.8 megajoules and 500 terawatts of power. That power, when they fire the laser beam, exceeds the instantaneous power generation of all the electricity in the world. On the right-hand side, you see the target chamber where all those laser beams get directed to focus in, down in on a little helpless central fuel cell. Okay, what about the progress? So the schemes are then we want to confine it with magnetic fields or not confine it by doing it very fast with laser beams. We want to capture the neutrons and the helium and lead to both ignition temperature and sufficient confinement for net energy gain. So I'm going to show something of the progress and also highlight that, in fact, there still is a lot of work to be done. The science is moving inexorably to the engineering phase now. And so whether it's materials, plasma control, measurements, robotics, uh, fuel breeding, all of these are becoming key things in the next step. OK, here's two graphs to show you the progress. The first shows the fusion power generated as a function of time starting in 1970 up to the year 2000. And you can see what different tokamak devices have done. And if you ask, well, why did you stop there? The answer is the world in the 1990s uh, said, well, maybe we have to make the step now to build the really big tokamak device to show that we can really produce net fusion energy gain. That refers to the dashed line eater. And so the world didn't build so many more big ones in between. They said, let's go full stop to the bigger size that we really need. And I'll come to that. The right-hand side shows the how fusion, in fact, has been progressing compared to, you think of Moore's law in producing microchips uh, for all our computers. And this Moore's law is literally a doubling uh, every uh, few years. Uh, well, fusion uh, has been progressing at an even faster rate of progress. And this now is not just the, it's the product of the confinement and the temperature. So if I take that triple product of T and N and tau, put them together as what I really have to have, uh, you can in fact see in that same period the progress. So it's at that point the world said, let's go out and build a big device. And it was sparked by the Reagan Gorbachev meeting uh, in the late 1990s that is a, a good world constructive thing. Let's build ITER. Well, here's where ITER configures in. A, you need the loss in confinement. And that's going up the left side of the graph. And you need the ion temperature across, shown across the bottom. It shows where in green where some of the devices have been getting to, and you can see quite close to unity. And ITER is meant to be that big step to take you into a really burning situation that we've got full fusion working to explore all that we have to learn under those conditions. So that is where ITER is going and what guided the uh, getting to it. And the world is involved in that big time, except Canada. It's a global initiative. There's 35 countries involved. 
It's a $25 billion US project, 45% of which is funded by the European Union because they're hosting it in Catarache in France and the other countries split up the other 55% for funding. But there you see the countries uh, engaged and a schematic of the device. This is what the device looks like compared to Eater uh, to Jet. So Jet down there with the Q less than Unity and now with DT burning in the next year should get above Unity, but it's scaling up the volume by a factor of 10, aiming for a net 500 megawatts of output heated heating at a Q of 10. So I'll put in power of 10 of 50 megawatts and I'll get out 500 megawatts. And you can see the scale by looking at the bottom of that eater device. There's a canonical man shown in blue down under the piping there. That gives you some idea of the size of the machine. So this is undoubtedly going to work. We're going to learn an awful lot about confining hot plasma fusion conditions but it's not going to be the device that you're going to want to build as a commercial device for producing power. And I'll come back to that. On the inertial side, this shows a map of the world where you've got these laser systems and research going on. NIF in California is the biggest. LMG for laser megajoule in Bordeaux in France is building a system of comparable size to NIF. Uh, it's got most of the lasers up now, not quite all of them yet, uh, but it's getting there. And then ILE in Japan, the Institute for Laser <clears throat> Energetics at the Osaka University, uh, working on an alternative scheme that I'll, I'll hint at in a minute. Okay, this is the size of the ignition facility uh, in California. You see the blue target chamber in the middle there. And you see the two laser bays with all the laser beams being generated. That occupies about seven uh, or eight NHL arenas in size. It's a big, it's a big device. That was designed and started building in the mid 1990s where they worked with the existing laser technology because they wanted to get this off the ground. If you started that today, we now use solid state lasers and light emitting diodes, and the footprint would be more than 10 times smaller. So you can see what technological progress does as we start out with various initially large systems and how they can be scaled down. So a, a laser fusion facility today would be one tenth the size of that. It would be down into less than one ice rink kind of thing. Okay, what about the progress? I've shown you the progress on the magnetic. Here's the progress using NIF. And you can see the blue dots going up from the one megajoule of laser energy to the 1.8 megajoule of laser energy uh, in terms of approaching that ignition and burning plasma situation. Uh, the earlier results, and that's up to a couple of years ago, all the earlier results we're only getting a fusion energy out of about a quarter of a megajoule. It was working its way up, but never exceeding about a quarter of a megajoule. On August the 8th this year, they did it almost perfectly in that they got essentially to ignition because they got an output energy of 1.3 megajoules of fusion. Well, that's a queue of about two thirds as well. So the laser fusion queue of two thirds is now the same as we'd had historically generated in the magnetic fusion. So the question is, where do we go from here? Well, ITER is gonna take us to Q greater than one. Uh, we expect on the laser side that we'll get greater than Q1 as well. And all of this then is going to really signal a conversion to commercial building of devices to turn it into commercial reality. Just before I get to that, let me point out the alternative advanced concepts. That's the ones that are going to fit into various schemes to try and get there faster and so on. Uh, they will face the same technical issues as the long researched uh, big mainline programs that have been entirely funded by government all over the world. Uh, here's one of the alternatives. I mentioned it earlier, the Stellarator. 
people didn't do it because of the complex magnetic field coils, uh, but Japan and Germany, as you might imagine, with their engineering prowess, uh, they've both gone out and done it. They've actually built these coils as a, a very sophisticated computer design to put the whole thing together. And this is the machine in Germany called Wendelstein uh, 7X that is now operating and getting the first heating results. And they're in the process of upgrading the heating so they can take it into an advanced configuration as well. But the Stellarator is starting to move. Here's four representative examples of about two dozen enterprises going on in the world with alternative approaches. I'll highlight Commonwealth Fusion Systems. That's an outgrowth of MIT in collaboration with a private sector funding. And it comes out of the superconducting magnetic technology developments at MIT, where when I show you ITER, the reason that device is so big is because while it's superconducting magnets, it's older technology, and you can only get up to a certain maximum magnetic field. And it turns out if you can't get the field higher, you need a larger radius volume. Spark is intended to take the new superconducting magnetic technology that MIT just announced in the news a week ago has now reached 20 Tesla magnetic fields. That's about two and a half times the field of ITER. And you can scale the machines roughly like the fourth power of the magnetic field. So if my ITER takes a certain volume, this device, Spark device, will aim to build a device about 40 times smaller that becomes a very interesting commercial candidate. So magnetic field technology out of MIT is the key to doing this one. They've now been funded to several hundred million dollars. Gates and Bezos, Koshla, and uh, even ENI, which is an Italian uh, oil gas company, they're funding it to move this out and they've actually got US uh, land, Fort Devens in Massachusetts as a site to build this device. So that's a, a, a work in progress. They hope to have a demonstration uh, in five years and a full commercial in 10. General Fusion is our one Canadian contribution to Fusion. It's based in Burnaby. And there they're using a scheme intermediate to magnetic and inertial. So we'll call it magneto inertial, where they use acoustics, just simple power drivers to produce strong shock waves not as fast as the laser, but shock waves nonetheless, to compress a cylindrical target configuration at the center uh, up to fusion conditions. And it is circulated then as well, the target fuel. Because they've developed to a certain state but needed more funding, more support, they have now just moved it this year to take their demo phase to the UK. The UK is very open and supportive of fusion development in everything, in government policy, in the industry, uh, in the regulatory, uh, they're really moving ahead aggressively. So they welcome General Fusion to come over and build their demo plant on the Cullum site. So that's a work in progress, but it's not being done in Canada that makes me upset. TAE is a tri-alpha energy that's in California and it's working with one of the alternative fuel concepts, proton, and a boron fusion, which would give you direct electrical conversion possibilities. And helium in Washington state is yet another uh, inner, uh, not a magnetic uh, conversion environment. <clears throat> Pardon me. In terms of advanced inertial effects, rather than doing all the work of high energy to compress a fuel pellet all the way to the ignition point at center, is there a potentially better way to go? Well, yes, there is. Suppose I just partially compress that fuel and then I could bring in an external igniter, like bringing a match up to wet fuel that we're now calling fast ignition or shock ignition. And then I suddenly bring in a short pulse to trigger a burn instead of relying on compression all the way to center. Well, those approaches, it turns out, give us some very interesting possibilities. 
And here on a graph is shown what happens to the target gain as a function of your laser energy. You can look down at the bottom to see what the NIF projections are and what gain you might have by going to uh, different lasers and different configurations like shock ignition or, or fast ignition. So in fact, there are some really interesting possibilities to move the inertial fusion forward once we've got past the uh, NIF stage two. Okay, the future, <clears throat> we're saying we're going to have that infinitely sustainable clean energy, but what we'll, we'll also get is a lot of economic impact. Let's just sort of go through a little bit of what's going on in the world. So for magnetic and inertial fusion, we're getting up to close to Q equals one. And certainly within five to 10 years, we're gonna have demonstration in various places of Q greater than 10 or more. That's really going to say, let's move it to the commercial phase. There I have to point out that Europe and Asia, in fact, are leading. They've long had fusion embedded in their energy policy. And that includes fusion. And Asia, China, India, uh, Europe, with Germany, France, everybody, uh, UK, they're all saying fusion is the future. We've got to really invest in and get there. Uh, China, it, apart from being a contributor to the uh, EATER project, is doing even bigger things at home with the idea that they don't want to wait for the 2040s and 50s. They have set an objective to have fusion demonstration in the 2030s as well. So they're building devices at home and they've already achieved in Tokamaks over 100 million degrees and confinement times of 100 seconds. So they're going to move very fast on this. What we've got now is the private sector jumping in and that will really hasten the development. I'm very encouraged by that. Uh, it, it, the combination of public private is really going to work here. Coming to the US and Canada, where even in the US, fusion was done as big science, not as energy. Uh, now they're moving that way. And just in the last year, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine have issued a report recommending the US also build a demonstration power reactor. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the US is now working on industry regulatory standards. I attended one just uh, the other day. Uh, these are going on with the idea of, uh, of bringing it up to where fusion versus fission and other radioactive uh, substances and handling and safety. But we expect, in fact, and the UK is already saying it through their regulatory, that they're treating fusion like they are any other big industrial petrochemical plant, any large industry plant, in terms of overall safety and regulatory handling of radioactive substances. So I think we'll get a lot of guidance from the UK uh, experience there. I have to highlight Canada as the only um, organization of the, you know, the economically uh, developed countries that does not have a national fusion program. We had one for a brief period back from the 80s to 90s. It was canceled and uh, we've been a looker on ever since. So we have a general fusion on the side. In fact, we have for tritium, a key fusion fuel product, uh, Ontario Power Generation Tritium. Uh, it is the biggest generator of tritium in the world. It's a byproduct of the heavy water reactor. And so they're, they're scaling up to become a tritium supplier to Eater uh, and to other tritium uh, needs as well, <clears throat> uh, besides fusion. To say a word, our Fusion Energy Council of Canada, I had started this a long time ago as originally an Alberta initiative to try and get more interest in the future energy uh, uh, where we had to go eventually from fossil fuels. Uh, had interest at various stages, almost got things going and then various economic conditions would come along that killed it. And then back uh, some time ago, I decided we're going to have to take this nationally and get the federal side engaged. And I'd always been briefing people at the federal level, but not seriously. Now we've moved it and we have now membership and board and executive from BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Quebec, 
all of the places where there's some activity going on in fusion in Canada. And we're looking to grow this and try and get a national commitment to really engaging us seriously in the future. Okay, two, two summary slides. Fusion, uh, we've seen that it's gonna be important for electric power generation. It can do the on-demand, it can turn it on and off. Uh, it'll be there for hydrogen and synthetic fuels, uh, heat, desalination of seawater, sea cleaning up your fish and waste. Uh, it's, it's, it's good for everything. For industrial policy, and I hear I just do this one from the inertial side alone. If you look at what the developments have been in high power lasers, in optics, in photonics, and let me say photonics, you think of the world of electronics since the invention of the diode and the transistor in the 1950s and 60s, and where that took us in everything, photonics has already taken over from electronics. It's growing even faster at about double the growth rate uh, commercially. Uh, this is a very important future that's gonna be doing everything, and especially as we go into self-driving cars and sensors, instrumentation, robotics, fusion will be plants not built one off. They'll be modular things built in the factory, trucked out and uh, with remote uh, handling and so on. A lot of computer control. Um, there's a lot of other side advantages for medical applications and so on. Additive manufacturing, you name it, it's, it's gonna be a real driver of where the world goes. So here's my last slide. It's A to say fusion is going to become a reality. We do expect technical demonstration by the 2030s. And then it's a matter of how fast it moves commercially. It's going to solve a lot of energy environmental problems. And it's going to give us tremendous economic opportunities going forward. I thank you for your time and uh, interest. And uh, please help us get the fusion uh, item on the discussion agenda in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, for a very interesting presentation. And we'll now have an opportunity to ask questions. We'll be using the chat window to, to accept questions by text. And I see some of you have already put your questions in, which is great. Um, so uh, please type in your question, and I will present the question uh, for, for response from Dr. Offenberger. And um, as I mentioned, the session's being recorded. So uh, please indicate if, if uh, um, you don't want your name to be included with the question when it's posed. So um, the first question I have <clears throat> is, does the ITER Totomac, Tokamak plant represent a real prospect of coming online and satisfying energy demand? Or are the other methods more realistic in the near term? The answer is <clears throat> the ITER from the beginning was designed to be an experimental device. It will never put power on the grid. We expect it to produce a lot of heat power, but there is no machinery to run up turbines and generators to uh, generate electricity. So it was always imagined from the beginning to be an experimental device to show that you could get a Q greater than one, along with all of the material science and control and diagnostics that you need to develop for future machines, all of that learning curve uh, to be done on ITER. Thank you. Uh, next question. What is the financial incentive for transition to this energy from private corporations, sorry, from this energy form, either for private corporations or for the stock market? The answer is twofold. One is we are going to be stopping burning fossil fuels. So in terms of your fuel sources for the future, uh, we rely very heavily right now on fossil fuels. They won't be around. Uh, they're producing 60% of the energy, um, and, and we have to come up with, with that for the future. And uh, renewables will not generate it as well. So the financial incentive is, A, whoever supplies the energy gets to sell the energy. That will drive investment in fusion. And the second half of the question was what? Was uh, um, the, uh, what's the financial <clears throat> 
corporation, uh, sorry, the financial incentive for private corporations, which you answered, and also for the stock market, which I think is pretty similar. Uh, yeah, and and in fact, and you can see it, if the people like Gates and Bezos and Koshla are getting involved in funding these uh, developments, it's because they recognize we're going to get there and they want to have a handle uh, on what commercial possibilities come out of that. So that's the first answer. Uh, the, the other answer is, uh, you're going to see a lot of money pouring in in the next decade into fusion development. So, and the stock market will come a bit later. Let's leave the stock market for maybe a decade, uh, but for private sector involvement, it'll become private equity for the next decade, I'm sure. Thanks. The next question <clears throat> concerning fusion cleaning up fission waste. So how does that work? And do you think that there's a prospect to clean up all the fission waste that we have in the world? Uh, the answer is yes. The, um, when you have uh, fission um, uranium-238 uh, to plutonium-239 or thorium-232 to uranium-233 as fissionable material, uh, when you've got the radioactive waste at the end of the day, if I can add extra neutrons to that stuff, I change their uh, elemental form and can eliminate the uh, radioactivity. The question is, where do I get the neutrons from to transmute these radioactive substances, uh, whether it's depleted uranium or, uh, or other radioactive substances? That's where fusion comes in, because the direct result of fusion is helium and neutrons. I can take those neutrons to use them for power generation, or I can take those neutrons to go out into the blanket surrounding and if i had that blanket loaded with say depleted uranium those neutrons would induce a lot more fissioning type events to transmute the material so it's the source of neutrons in copious numbers that's needed uh, to make transmutation work and fusion is that source thanks um can you comment on why the canadian government has not been supporting the uh, fusion research research uh, there's a lot of geopolitics involved in that. Uh, I won't get go into all of it, but one simple part of it was uh, back when ITER was being discussed in the 90s, there was a question of where would it be cited? Europe wanted it, Asia wanted it, North America wanted it. It was seen that because we had the tritium source, uh, that Ontario might be the site of the ITER because it had the US next door, and the uh, east-west uh, making it a central location plus it had the uh, tritium uh, and lots of other power around to run magnets and so on so when we first got our canadian program going from the 80s on uh, the hope was and canada actually uh, brought forward a proposal to have uh, the eater tokamak built in canada that didn't happen because along the way at one point in the uh, Eater discussions, the US dropped out of it. Canada decided, hey, if the US is not part of this international project, it's not going to end up coming to North America. They dropped out of fusion altogether. A year later, the US was back into Eater, but Canada was out and stayed out. Thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you've heard the uh, old joke that for the past half century, commercial, commercial fusion power is 10 to 20 years away, and it always will be 10 to 20 years away. So can you comment on why it's different this time? I think the results I just showed you say why it's very different. Uh, A, in the results that we're getting to Q greater than one, which is what you have to do to make it commercially viable. We weren't in that position before we are there now. And secondly, that in turn has unlocked uh, the deep pockets, private equity of the Gateses and other people to say, let's now step it up. And the important one there, uh, well, there's several of them, but one of them is the Commonwealth Fusion Systems being funded by uh, that private equity venture with MIT wholly, to totally engaged. This is one of the enterprises that MIT as an institution is backing as a way to get to that future clean energy. So that's got a lot of impetus to it. 
if you take the general fusion from Canada, the fact that it go it go into open arms in the UK because they want to back fusion, and they're they're willing to explore a lot of different possibilities. They too have put hundreds of millions of pounds on the table. That is the UK government to encourage the development. We're into a very different phase now. That sounds very promising. <clears throat> this this time, th I think I I believe this time it will be different. Go MIT. Uh, okay, so a, a technical question now. As the products of fusion are high energy plasma and neutrons, how is this energy absorbed without damaging the absorber? Uh, first of all, I'll talk about the helium as a, a charged particle inside the burning fuel. As I mentioned, it collisionally gives up energy to the fuel to keep the heating process going on. And by the before it ever escapes from the plasma, it's basically exhausted its energy. So it now emerges as a low energy helium that we collect as a gas. So the helium is a very benign thing and it's needed to self heat the fuel. The neutrons, they escape unhindered from the burning plasma and they come out to the wall of your reactor and they are the things that have most of the energy. And so you want to capture that energy in order to make your useful power device. So the answer is in that wall, apart from the neutrons passing through a, a vacuum wall, behind that vacuum wall, you would have a circulating blanket that would have lithium in it so that the neutrons, when they get into that lithium, can nuclear-wise produce tritium and helium the neutron plus a lithium in that circulating blanket. So there's a, a vacuum wall of material that the neutron passes through, then there's the lithium blanket, and then there's the circulation and all the rest of the hardware. So the issue of the neutrons being useful is getting them into the lithium and absorbing the heat as well as producing tritium. The unattractive part is having to pass through that vacuum wall on the way to the lithium and depending upon what that vacuum wall is, you have more or less induced radioactivity. As I say, if it's steel, there's radioactivation. If it's uh, with about a hundred year lifetime, if it's vanadium steels, it has radioactivation of about a 10 year lifetime for, to decay away. If it's silicon carbides, it would not produce any radioactivation in the first place of any significance. So that material wall becomes important not only for the radioactivation, but also the neutrons being high energy, they can actually displace the atoms in the material wall and induce swelling and decay and eventually rupture. So the material damage becomes an issue uh, when exposed to neutrons as well. And that's why probably you would design, especially inertial systems, you would design reactor things that you would just wheel one in and wheel uh, the other one out uh, for uh, fresh wall material all the time. It would be an easy thing to do. So there's, there's a lot of materials issues that come in there is what we're saying. Okay, thanks. I, I think that answers the um, um, a, an additional question as well. Um, so uh, another question, um, in terms of extracting energy, from, from the neutrons, what are the most promising solutions for that? Well, as I mentioned, because we have to produce the tritium, there is an essential necessity for lithium in the blanket. And so behind the vacuum wall as the neutrons pass through mostly, uh, they get absorbed in the lithium generating tritium. And it's the lithium that is your circulating fluid. And as you circulate it, either gas or liquid form, there's different ways you can do it. But as you circulate it to the outside world, you would process it to extract the tritium uh, before sending it to a secondary loop that would have yet another heat exchange to a water um, steam cycle. Uh, so the, the, key, the key material in between though is your lithium in whatever form, solid uh, or liquid or gaseous form, that would be carrying the tritium and the heat out of the uh, reactor. One question I have concerning lithium, because I know that um, that uh, that's something that's uh, also um, a hot commodity uh, for for batteries. Is there is there a competition there? 
I don't think so from two points. Well, for the first five, 10 years, yes, uh, because lithium is going to go into EV batteries um, and fusion's not yet on the table. But after a decade, uh, I expect it to self-sort in two ways. Uh, one is already we're starting to do a lot more work on hydrogen fuels. So in the end, at the end of a decade, it won't be just electric batteries. It will be uh, fuel cells with hydrogen. Uh, so that will reduce the need for lithium. Uh, secondly, as fusion comes on, uh, there will be no need for lithium batteries because you can then produce all the hydrogen you want once you've got your uh, fusion as your energy source. And so in the long run, then fusion can take over burning the, uh, the lithium. But remember, there's two isotopes of lithium, and it's the lithium-6 that we want for fusion and the main commodity in lithium is lithium-7. So you can continue to use the lithium-7 as far as we're concerned for, for electric vehicles. But there will be a natural transition as we move out through the decades. I expect by the middle of the century, not only fusion being here, but I expect hydrogen fuel cells to be a much more important component because now you get infinite range, you get five minute fill-ups, uh, you've got your clean, totally clean, uh, uh, energy structure from the fusion producing the energy all the way through to the hydrogen being the way that you use the energy. And we've got a totally clean system. So lithium, in the meantime, you can use it, but you won't use it all up. The other is, remember, the amount of lithium that we need is so small. We're talking about a few hundred kilograms per reactor uh, per year. And when you think of the millions of tons of stuff out there, uh, we're, we're going to make a small dent in it before fusion takes over. Thanks, that makes sense. Um, and uh, we'll do one, one last question. Um, and uh, that's uh, um, why, why do we expect that we've, um, it's taken so long to get to Q equals one. Um, why do you think we're going to be able to get up to Q equals five so quickly? The first answer is uh, at the beginning, a very wise man said, fusion will be the toughest technological nut that mankind has ever tried to crack. This was recognized 50 years ago. We've had no bigger challenge. Going to the moon and space is child's play by comparison. Fusion would be the biggest te technology hurdle. So we knew that at the beginning, and therefore it was a case of how long to get the science, the technology, the enabling uh, areas and so on up to speed that would be able to get you to Q equals one and beyond. And we've done that now. It's taken 60 years, but we've really done a fantastic job with a lot of players from a lot of spheres uh, that have brought technologies to where now you can buy A and B and C components and say, I'm going to put this together and, uh, and pursue it. That sounds like a very hopeful note to end on. So uh, thank you again for a very informative presentation. And thanks also for the, all the thoughtful questions from the participants. Uh, just a few closing remarks. So first, I'd like to mention that CFIC will be having our second online mini conference called Mind, Brain and Thought. It's coming up on Sunday, November 14th. We have an exciting lineup planned, including our keynote speaker, who will be actor and director William B. Davis, perhaps best known for his role as Smoking Man from the X-Files. We also have other single event talks in the works, so check your local meetup groups or Facebook for updates. As I mentioned at the beginning, CFIC is Canada's only national nonprofit for scientific inquiry and secular community. We hope that those of you who are not already members will consider purchasing a membership. We'll include a link to our membership page in the chat window and also through Meetup. I hope that you will consider joining. Not only does your membership provide financial support to CFIC, it also adds your voice to that of others who support science, critical thinking, and secularism. As we grow in numbers, so does our influence with government decision makers and with the public opinion that guides them. We advocate for evidence-based decision making and that's contrary to what I heard somebody was talking about decision-based evidence-making. 
we want evidence-based decision making on government policy, healthcare, public education, and human rights. So if concerns like climate change, blasphemy laws, education curriculum, and medical pseudoscience are important to you, then please consider becoming a CFI member. Without us, the major influencers will continue to be large self-interested groups and institutions that benefit from making baseless claims and spreading pseudoscience. Finally, I'd like to help, I'd like to thank the CFIC volunteers who help with this and our other events. If you'd like to volunteer with CFIC, you can sign up on our website. We have many interesting positions and opportunities. Once more, I'd like to thank Alan for being our speaker. And since Zoom does not deal well with audible clapping, I invite everyone to express your appreciation by using the clap icon that you can find by tapping or clicking in the reactions area and then selecting more. So thank you to everyone and hope to see you all next time. Thank <laughs> you.